The year is 2005. You're home alone, a little stoned, knuckle deep in a bag of bugles, and you're enjoying the American dream. Channel surfing to your heart's content. You're stuck between a couple of things. One of them is a Nicolas Cage movie from the 1990s that hasn't aged well. Another is some sports match you're only half paying attention to. Suddenly, and without warning, you see this. Why have you woken me from my nap? Mania! <laughs> Ernest Borgnine from The Poseidon Adventure. It's something you can't explain, something you can't decipher, something so wild and ridiculous that even in your weed-laden state of existence, you can't rush to give it a name or even a genre. What the hell is this show? And what is Drew Carey doing there? Folks, if you have never heard of the fever dream that was Drew Carey's green screen show, I advise you all to strap in. This one is going to get a little weird. Drew Carey's Green Screen Show was an improv show in the same vein as Carey's prior hosting venture, Whose Lines It Anyway, a show that greatly shaped my sense of humor. The Green Screen Show essentially took the improv games used on Whose Line and set them against a green screen. Later, in post-production, the footage would be animated over by trained professionals, making the scenes complete and adding a sense of heightened, and oftentimes strange, visualization to the proceedings. Drew Carey's Green Screen Show shot in 2004, and ran for 12 episodes on two different networks. If you're watching it right now, that means we're still in the air, so we're still be doing pretty good, right? By all accounts, the experiment failed. And we're going to take a look at why. Why did this weird show even exist in the first place? And how could the public fail to latch on to such a wild and interesting idea? But in order to answer the question of why an improv show on a green screen didn't work, we must first answer the question of why an improv show on television worked in the first place. Something I've heard contemporarily from many improv performers is that it's insanely difficult to televise improv comedy. Improv is very much a stage-based medium, so much of the experience comes from going to a live show and seeing a troupe put on a full show for you. Bottling that and selling it to television audiences is very difficult. What made Whose Line successful is that you had some of the best improv performers on this continent, all of whom knew each other's strengths and weaknesses, landing on their feet 90% of the time. And at least the other 10%, it would be really funny. Oh, placenta! <laughs> you trusted people like Ryan Stiles, Colin Mockery, Wayne Brady, Greg Proops, Brad Sherwood, Chip Eston, and even Drew Carey at times, to name just a few, because they did things that only experts could pull off. And as much as I've wished that Whose Line would rotate cast members and recreate some of the variety they had in the UK version, this sort of safety net is what made Whose Line a success and why people are still talking about it today. What also led to the success was the show's production model, set by longtime producers Dan Patterson and Mark Levison, under the umbrella of their production company, Angst Productions. By the end of the show's U.S. tapings in fall 2001, they'd been doing the same thing for 13 years, and it had worked this entire time. Clearly, these two know what they're doing, because they're some of the only people to make televised improv work in multiple contexts. Whose line works because of Angst? Subsequently, a recent production of Whose Line that went ahead without angst did not work. I say this, yet Drew Carey at this point in the 2000s had developed the sort of confidence to believe that if he were to do his own improv show, he didn't need angst. Drew was a stand-up comedian more than anything, and had become the host of Whose Line because of his friendship with Ryan Stiles, who he'd seen on the UK Whose Line and personally asked to join the Drew Carey show as a regular. Then, as the Drew Carey show became a hit for ABC, and Angst inquired about shopping Who's Line to U.S. markets, all of the stars aligned for ABC to adapt the show using Carey as a host. Through this show, he slowly came into some improv prowess, and by the end, could definitely hold his own with the performers. It's this sort of improved improvability, and improv knowledge, that led Drew to form his own touring improv troupe, based mostly off of Who's Line's repertory company, and filled out with people that auditioned for the show and didn't make it, or were in adjacent improv circles, or were people that he knew from the Drew Carey show who had improv background. The Improv All-Stars, as they were known, toured regularly during the early 2000s as a way of promoting the show and promoting live improv. The show also used a rotating roster of performers, meaning that Drew could miss shows, Colin and Ryan could miss shows, and you could literally see a different show every night. The games that the All-Stars used on the road were a mix of games that worked on Who's Line, like Greatest Hits, Questions Only, Duets, Sound Effects, 
as well as games that worked more in a stage environment, like New Choice, a more active version of film and theater styles known as Options, Improv Jeopardy, and Story. Here, you see Drew deviating from the Who's Line model and curating a show that could work for live audiences. Hell, there was a pay-per-view of the 2001 All-Stars show, and it's a great picture of how strong this troupe was in that era, as well as how much newer additions like Jeff Davis, Sean Masterson, Julie Larson, and Kathy Kinney could contribute. This is Bobo the Monkey's last show. <laughs> We're selling him off to medical research. Now, flash forward three years. Whose Line has been put in an indefinite holding pattern, as the large backlog of footage ABC has is just wearing thin, and they're about to let the run die out on ABC Family. The Drew Carey Show is just ending after a very impressive nine-year run. The television landscape is changing every second. And Drew Carey, for the first time in nearly a decade, is without a show. Once he had two, now he has none. And he'd prefer it to not stay that way. Something I should also mention around this point is that somewhere in this timeline, Drew becomes acquainted with a section of Warner Brothers animation called Acme Filmworks. From what I can gather, as Warner Brothers animation became very connected with the Ted Turner, Hanna-Barbera development process that would admittedly produce the best era of Cartoon Network, there were several animators who felt that Warner was straying from their original roots as a small community of pranksters with paintbrushes. One of the main minds here you have to think about is Eric Goldberg most famous for being a character animator on many Disney projects and being the chief mind behind the loony end of 2003's Looney Tunes back in action. These guys were seeing less and less space in the Warniverse for their old school loony ideas and needed a vessel to produce work they could be proud of. I'm not quite sure how Drew met these guys, although if I had to hazard a guess. You are one weird duck. You ain't just whistling Dixie, fat boy! <laughs> so Drew has their business card in his back pocket. At the same time, the Improv All-Stars keeps touring, Colin and Brad begin their duo tour. With no TV show to promote, they start relying more on the stage shows. Around here is where Drew gets an idea to bring the All-Stars to TV in some capacity. But it's missing a hook that'll make it different from Who's Line. And that's when it clicks. Drew, contemporarily, would admit that the game Moving People, where audience members move the performers throughout a scene, inspired Drew to make the green screen show. It's a question of, what if we could play that game and not see the audience members? Well, if there was a green screen, anything could be possible. And that was Drew's pitch to the networks. An improv show filmed on a green screen in front of a live studio audience, then handed off to a cornucopia of animators, including many Acme Filmworks hands and other indie animated giants like Bill Plimpton, and they'd fill in the blanks and make the scenes whole. It's a risky setup, but with the best in animation, it'd look fantastic and it would give a whole new element to the already great improv comedy that Drew was farming. The network that eventually agreed to air the green screen show was the WB. The WB at this point was a dying network who had just lost their biggest hit, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and in two years would merge with UPN to form the CW. How well do you think this went? Nevertheless, in April 2004, the official pilot for what was then being called the Untitled Green Screen Project was filmed in L.A. The roster of performers for the pilot was all 12 of the All-Stars troop members of that point. Drew, of course, Ryan Stiles, Colin Mockery, Brad Sherwood, Greg Proops, Chip Eston, Jeff Davis, Kathy Kinney, Sean Masterson, Jonathan Mangum, Julie Larson, and Caitlin Olson. That's right, if you never knew that D from Always Sunny was in the Who's Line gang before Always Sunny, now you know. At this taping... Drew spoke promisingly about the partnership with Acme Filmworks and said that if the WB felt good about how the pilot went, they would order more, which did end up happening, but only for five more tapings. Also, no footage from the pilot ever made air. If the pilot ever did go out, nobody taped it, and it's technically lost media. Which is a shame, because this is the only episode that Ryan and Caitlin ever did. Ryan would later basically admit that he fell out of love with the concept and stepped down when the show got a full series order, while Caitlin got busy with that other show she was doing. But the show went on with the 10-man rep company. There would be five regulars in the form of Drew, Brad, Greg, Colin, and Jeff. The other five would alternate shows. They had five official tapings, and the hope was that they'd play enough games that they'd have material for years. We got 12 episodes. There has to be so many unfinished green screen show games sitting in a WB vault somewhere with the extra ABC footage from Who's Line. On October 7, 2004, the WB would air the first episode of Drew Carey's Green Screen Show. 
Episode 1 started, as every episode would start, in a lavish setting that would be stripped back to reveal the show's true concept. Of course, it's called the Green Screen Show, because I'm not on this great set that we've drawn for you. I'm actually on this set, the big green ugly stage right here in Hollywood, California, in front of a live studio audience. Say hi to our audience. Yay! The first episode of the show had a fairly unassuming lineup of games. The show would begin with Freeze Tag, the touring crew's warm-up of choice, which would be one of the games most improved by adding animation. Oh, great, I'm dead. <laughs> Then a round of sentences, this version's iteration of the game Who's Line, followed by a round of new choice and ending with one syllable word. A questions only style quick fire head to head round where players must only speak in one syllable words. You lost cash on that horse? Yes, that nag there. I think you are not s tell. <laughs> it's an amusing enough episode, but it feels like it ends right when it's about to get going. Curiously, the second episode features the exact same game selection. Freeze, sentences, new choice with the same two performer combo, and one syllable word. A lot of fans of modern CW Who's Line complain about how every show has either scenes from a hat, helping hands, or greatest hits, but this is two identical game sets to start the series. New viewers aren't going to know that it's not just the same four games every week. And considering what the editors had to choose from, it's kind of curious that the selection was so limited. One of Drew Carey's dreams for Green Screen Show was to dabble into montages and longer form improv, something Whose Line had rarely ever attempted. Several Green Screen Show tapings featured multiple long form scenes, suggested by only one or two key words, and given to the rest of the group. While this did leave some performers, especially Colin Mockery, out of their comfort zones, it did enhance the group's versatility and was a welcome showcase to a form of improv that doesn't always work on television. But those longer scenes not only took up more episode time, they were also more difficult to animate. That may be why the first two shows had those specific games, because they were easier for the animators to finish, and likely because they were done quicker. The assembly line production of the animation also explains why many episodes cull from multiple tapings, as getting the material into episodes was more of a jigsaw puzzle of what would fill a traditional 21-minute runtime. This also means that odds and ends of bigger montages were shaved off to fill empty episode space in the event of a bottom-loaded show, as well as longer games whittled down, in some cases time-lapsing gags and truncating middle portions of a game. That's not to say the quality of these first few shows were lacking entirely. Episode 1 features a really nice sentences scene with Julie and Drew, where Drew flexes his now great improv muscles. The game isn't over until the fat lady sings. Oh. <laughs> Let me put on a wig and warm up. Episode 2 has a very funny new choice, where it becomes clear that Jeff is deliberately screwing with Colin as a caller. It's now time to feed the baby. New choice. <laughs> it's now time to think about redecorating the house. New choice. <laughs> it's now time to swear off sex forever. <laughs> Episode 2 also features a one-syllable word where Brad Sherwood is practically unkillable. Three, four, five, six, I'm done, sir! <laughs> but the emphasis is less on what makes a great consistent episode and more on what's ready to go out. By the time Episode 3 was out, ratings were going down, meaning that many viewers missed one of the strongest new choice rounds in Who's Line history, Everybody knows that you murdered Betty Johnson just so you could have her baby-proofing business. New choice. Everybody knows that you murdered Betty Johnson just so you could have her rubber baby buggy bumper business. <laughs> Same choice with a Swedish accent. Everybody knows that you killed Betty Johnson. <laughs> Betty... <laughs> and one of the greatest game-breaking moments in the show's history. Whoa, I just got it. Freeze. You were... How long am I supposed to wait? <laughs> the punchline? The punchline. Sorry. Sorry. So Let's hear how <laughs> funny it was. So, uh, what did Julie just get? <laughs> Yoga hurts.
Further shows in this block of episodes went for grander game selection, like episode 4, whose centerpiece was a new round called Hollywood Moments, where Jeff, at any point, could make a performer break into a sappy film monologue. I'm a wandering toaster fixer-upper. <laughs> London, 1925. My parents died three weeks before I was born. <laughs> But by episode 5, the ratings were nowhere near what the WB wanted, and the network would take the show off the air. Clearly something wasn't working. But wasn't it, though? The first five episodes of Green Screen Show featured everything one might enjoy about Who's Line. Excellent performer dynamics, a wide range of games, a sense of play, as well as an impressive imagination, and all the people that made Who's Line great. The real missing element was consistency. The editing and even the differing animation styles made Green Screen Show an odd patchwork of contrasting attitudes, especially the contrast between the Acme Filmworks animators, Drew and the performers, and the network. It's clear that all three parties wanted different things, and the resulting show was a compromise between them. Drew wanted a showcase for all sorts of improv, the animators wanted to show the wonders of their medium, and the network wanted something a wide range of people could enjoy. But there are some games that emphasize the performance more than the animation, some that value the animation more than the performance, and some that were only there to fill out the runtime. This tug in all directions is very evident, even in just the first five shows. But that's not to say they're completely bad. They're just a little soggier than usual. Case in point, Episode 5 features a game that works if you know what led up to it. New Choice is done by Jeff and Brad, two people who usually call the game, one of whom helped develop the game at Second City. Hey, here's a tip, by the way. If you ever meet Brad in real life and talk improv with him, it helps to know that. Just putting that out there. The caller in this case is Colin, who usually participates in this game. The whole taping season, Jeff had been the caller for Colin most of the time, and he'd been absolutely merciless, with him specifically. So as a bonus game at the end of the taping, hey, here's an extra new choice. Jeff and Brad, Colin calling. Might not even make it in, you never know. Colin doesn't call new choice for Brad the entire round. It is entirely a Jeff Davis torture round. And it is glorious. The field upon which we stand, the one that you have just purchased, is haunted by a ghost most foul. New choice. The field you purchased is actually made of people. <laughs> New choice. The field you purchased is actually the backyard of a man who stands 20 feet tall. Now, the hysterical quality of this game exists mainly if you know that detail. But if you don't, it's still funny, but you might be wondering why is he just going after Jeff? It's an inside baseball thing that enhances the experience. A lot like Greg chewing out Jeff for stepping over his punchline. Why, it's the funniest joke oracle in the world. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Yoga hurts. <laughs> It's also something general audiences might not get, which is why they weren't really getting general audiences. So the show is taken off the air in November 2004, a month after the premiere after only five episodes. But if you'll recall, I said earlier that there were 12 episodes that were aired. So what happened to the other seven? Well, after the cancellation, Drew shopped the show around to other networks because seven more shows were completed before the acts and he hoped he could at least find some place to air the rest of the run. And as luck would have it, Comedy Central was interested. And this is ironic because nearly a decade earlier, Comedy Central, then known as the Comedy Channel, started airing the UK Who's Line on their channel, which is how Drew caught the show in the first place. Of course Comedy Central comes to the rescue. So Comedy Central essentially burned off the remaining green screen shows in the fall of 2005. At last, viewers would see some of the games that provided Drew's inspiration for making the show such as a few montages, including a personal favorite where Brad pimps Jeff out to do an entire fight alone on stage. I want to see you fight that werewolf hover boy. I will. You bring him on. Remember, God will be watching. I'm going to go look this way. We'll... <laughs> you know what would be awesome? If we fought together in front of God. You should do it. I will. Hello, my name's Renee. Not like a girl, like a French guy. Oh, wait. Oh, my God. You're turning into a werewolf. I'll use my hovering ability to hover around you. Oh. What seems to be the problem here? <laughs> Thank you. And we'd get a game of Moving People aired, though 
we'd see why they didn't play it very often. I'm doing the St. Winer's Day dance, where I have no control over my body whatsoever. <laughs> hey, could that guy come out and beat the <laughs> out of me for a while longer? <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Those are show business terms. Oh, are there children here? Terrific. Yeah, right in the <laughs> Have you ever seen a grown man fondle another grown man that much? We'd also get to see even more inspired animation styles, fulfilling the TV to get high to building that Drew jokingly gave it. Does it sound like the greatest stoner show in the world? Well, it is. <laughs> Finally, surrounded by things like South Park and Lil Bush, Green Screen Show was where it should have been from the start. The remainder of the run did have its fair share of strengths, mostly when it would lean into things that would work on stage, like constantly throwing it to Colin during story. Oh, I am the most humble. I can't even be in the shadow of Steve because, oh, oh, what am I saying? I go in mad fear, I go mad. Then his eyes exploded, ow. That hurts. <laughs> or screwing a performer over during freeze. Freeze. <laughs> Welcome to the petting zoo. Freeze. I am a fan of the montages in this series because it gives the cast free reign to jump in and set dress, or in some cases jump in and wonder why they jumped in. I am the keeper of your dreams. Who are you? <laughs> extra, extra, I'm just an extra. <laughs> But the cobbled together quality of the shows and the inconsistency of the animation does dilute the quality of a lot of these. Some shows just aren't great, some games just don't work, and some performers just don't add much. That is the dice you roll with televised improv. And while Green Screen Show did have its fair share of really cool moments, I can see why the masses weren't exactly clamoring for more. It was a novel idea, it just didn't work as well as it should have. And it's a shame, because some of the unsung heroes of Drew Carey's Improv All-Stars got some much-needed time to shine during this show. Choosing Jeff Davis as a regular was a wise idea, as he had several moments of just dominating. What happened to... gay goats? <laughs> I'll tell you what happened to gay goats. General Gay Goats was murdered! Jonathan Mangum had his first real taste of gelling with the Who's Line crew, and it worked, well enough to get him ringside seats during the eventual revival of Who's Line. Never more shall I go skydiving. Hello, hello, hello. I see you've used the only Poe reference that I know. Plus, you get a lot more from the fourth seeders of Who's Line, like Brad, Greg, Chip, Kathy Kinney. Because of the ensemble effort, they all get time to shine, which is funny because there's even shows where Colin and Drew even don't get much to do at all. In an improv climate that mainly valued Ryan, Colin, and Wayne at that point, this was a great showcase for the other guys that were just as good that weren't getting on screen as much. It's just a shame that it was this crazy. We should split up! <laughs> After the failure of Green Screen Show, the All-Stars would eventually dissolve, forming smaller troops, including Who's Live, which still tours to this day, and the aforementioned Colin and Brad double act, which tours intermittently due to Colin's other project, Hiprov. Drew would rally the troops for one last ride for 2011's Improvaganza, though that would fail to catch on for different reasons. Maybe I'll do a video on that someday. And then, of course, Drew has been hosting The Price is Right ever since, Who's Line would come back on the air in 2013 and is giving up for their final episodes, and with Dropout looking like they're taking the reins, Improv on TV is doing just fine. The only people in this story that don't have the happiest ending are the folks from Acme Filmworks, as while they're still active, they're back to doing shorts and TV commercials, which is essentially where they were before Drew came along. So nothing's really changed. I'd still say check out their work, they seem to have the right idea, but this wasn't the opportunity they thought it would be. Oh, uh, the WB isn't a thing anymore either, but uh, fuck them. Drew Carey's green screen show was a sudden burst of originality in the night, a glittering instance of wild ideas and unprecedented collaboration that deserved better circumstances, a better network, and a better audience than it got. The episodes are easy to find online, though not exactly legally. Just put your ear to the right hive and you might find them. Except the pilot, though if anyone has any leads on that, please let me know. These shows didn't work for audiences in 2004, but maybe they'll work for you.
And if not, maybe all you need to do is just take a drag of something, get a bag of gummy worms, lay back, and maybe you'll see what I mean. I've got to take a couple of souls. I've got to take a couple of souls. I gotta take a couple of souls.